Hi, this is Aristides Cruz at University of Orthopedics. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking to you guys about overuse injuries in the adolescent athletes. And tonight, we're going to be talking about the why, what, and how of overuse injuries in the adolescent athlete. Again, my name is Aristides Cruz Jr. I'm one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons at University of Orthopedics, and we thank everybody for attending tonight. So just a little bit about myself to start off. Um, I am an assistant pre professor of orthopedic surgery at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown. My uh, clinical interests include trauma and fracture care, sports medicine related conditions, as well as uh, general pediatric orthopedics. I see mostly uh, children and adolescents um, with, uh, with these types of injuries. I obtained my undergraduate degree at Tufts University, went to medical school at Tufts, uh, did my residency at Yale. Uh, I was uh, uh, in the military in the U.S. Air Force for about three years uh, on active duty after my residency, and then I furthered my training with a pediatric orthopedic fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I've been here at Brown um, at the University of Orthopedics since 2015. I was an athlete in college. This is <laughs> just some pictures of me um, uh, during that time. Uh, the only reason I put this up is uh, just to uh, let let the community know that uh, I, I I do have some athletic experience and I just kind of I can um, empathize with uh, with these types of injuries that that kids are coming to see me for. What do I do? Uh, primarily, I do uh, pediatric sports medicine, so things like ACL reconstruction, uh, specialized ACL reconstruction procedures like skeletally immature ACL reconstruction. I'll do shoulder arthroscopy and then also uh, cartilage repair. And again, this, these are just just a sample of the things, types of things uh, that a pediatric orthopedic uh, sports medicine doctor does. Uh, what else do I do? Uh, you know, uh, it's not just sports, but we also uh, take care of general pediatric orthopedic conditions as well as trauma. Uh, so uh, with summer right around the corner, we're gonna that's kind of fracture season for us. So we we do see a lot of uh, pediatric fractures. Uh, especially now with school and the nice weather coming coming out. Uh, uh, what does an orthopedic surgeon do? Uh, so Mondays and Fridays, uh, I'm in the operating room doing uh, a mix of trauma and elective surgeries. I see off I see patients in the office two and a half out, uh, two and a half days a week. Uh, Tuesdays uh, at the Kettle Point office, Thursdays in our Mansfield office, and then Wednesday it, uh, alternates between our Kettle Point and, and uh, downtown Providence offices. Um, I take a call, I'm on call, quote unquote, about seven to eight days a month, and then usually about one weekend every, uh, every month. And then in addition to the clinical duties, I do have teaching responsibilities um, at the medical school, teaching medical students, as well as uh, with, the, with our uh, Brown University Orthopedic Residency Program. And also uh, we are responsible for uh, teaching allied health professionals like nurse practitioners and uh, physician's assistants. So uh, with after uh, just a brief introduction of myself, we're gonna go into the meat of this topic. Uh, these are just, a, this is just an outline of what we're gonna go over uh, today. Uh, we'll look at the prevalence and risk factors for sports specialization, why uh, you know, kids uh, tend to get these overuse injuries and primarily has a lot to do with the developing an adolescent skeleton. And then uh, the general principles of, of these conditions as well as their treatments. And then we'll review some specific injuries that you may have heard of. So what, there are multiple benefits with youth sports. Um, these range from uh, physical benefits of increased physical activity. Uh, and we know that kids who are active now tend to be active adults. Uh, so it's good to build good habits now. Uh, kids can uh, use sports to acquire their motor skills. Uh, so, you know, just kind of just developing their general uh, movement skills. And, uh, you know, weight bearing activity, athletic activity has been shown to enhance bone geometry and density as well. Now, in addition to the physical factors that uh, are beneficial for sports, there's a lot of psychosocial factors that also are of benefit. Um, you know, sports teach us goal setting. It learns, it learns to socialize us. We learn how to work as a team. We learn about sportsmanship. And overall, you know, the bottom line, it's sports are fun. Uh, this is a study from the National Council of Youth, uh, Youth Sports back in 2008, and it showed that the you know, youth participation in sports is pretty high. About 60 million children between uh, the ages of 6 and 18 years old organize and, uh, excuse me, participate in organized athletics. Uh, 44 million of these kids participate in more than one sport, and most participate year-round. 
uh, however, there is this uh, tendency uh, for a sports specialization, which we'll talk a little bit about, uh, which is attending the start at a very young age. And this is uh, kind of a trend that's been going, going on for the past several years. I put this slide up because um, back in 2018, the National Federation of, uh, State, and High, of State High School Associations uh, did a study kind of uh, looking at the overall landscape of uh, high school sports participation. And they actually showed that there was a decrease for the first time ever. Uh, excuse me, for the first, uh, for the first time in, in, in two decades, so since 1988-89, of high school sports participants. Uh, the biggest contributors to the decline were football and basketball. Um, and this is just kind of a, uh, a slide uh, uh, showing that. And what does this mean? Well, it was the first decline in high school sports in 30 years, uh, with an, after an all-time participation, high participation rate in 2017 and 2018. However, there's also been, uh, this kind of translates to an overall uh, long-term decline in, in youth sports. So I just said that the, you know, in America, we tend, a lot of you, a lot of athletes, or a lot of kids are participating in sports. However, this overall trend has been uh, slowly declining. And this could be due to uh, multiple, multiple factors. You know, there's been this decline in rec and town leagues, um, you know, maybe for participation reasons and budget issues. Uh, there's been this increased um, rate of participation in travel and club teams. Uh, and the costs of participating in sports have been uh, increasing. So like the entry, you know, your entry level uh, sports are getting more and more expensive, which may be out of reach for, for some people. Um, and I, you know, there's this little uh, schematic I have here of uh, the uh, allure of college scholarships. And we're gonna get a little bit more into this uh, later, a little bit later on in the talk. Um, the prevalence of uh, there's limited quality research on the incidence of prevalence uh, of overuse injuries in children and adolescents. However, uh, uh, overuse injuries represent you know about fifty percent of all injuries, so uh, it's not that um, uh, you know these acute injuries are not are, are just as common. Excuse me, overuse injuries are just as common as, as acute injuries. These overuse injuries do vary by sport. Our most common uh, sport uh, to sustain overuse injuries are, are running, uh, which kind of makes sense. Uh, and however, the prevalence is likely underestimated in our published studies. Uh, so meaning, you know, just because you have an overuse injury doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily documented. You know, you actually have to go see somebody for it, for that to be documented. What are the risk factors for overuse injuries? Uh, a prior injury is a very strong predictor. So meaning if you have an injury, if you've had an injury in the past, uh, you're more likely to sustain another injury in the future. It's more likely to occur during the adolescent growth spurt, growth spurt so think our early high school years. The reason this is is because um, uh, this, as you grow, the skeleton during these rapid growth phases are less resistant to, uh, to these forces that you know, the, uh, your kids' bodies are putting on them. Um, uh, there's also a decrease in the bone mineral density. That's what BMD stands for, uh, just prior to the growth spurt. So, uh, one, some may argue that uh, these kids just before the growth spurt might be a little bit, um, I don't want to say osteoporotic, that's the wrong word, but just their bone density might be just a little bit uh, uh, sh uh, less than ideal. Um, a history of amenorrhea in females is going to be a risk for stress fracture. So amenorrhea means um, uh, irregular periods. Um, so that's also a sign that uh, there could be something off that may, be incre that may increase uh, the risk uh, for overuse injuries, such as stress factors in females. And then higher training volumes are also uh, an increased risk. You know, other, other risk factors that you think about, of you know, poor fitting equipment, if they're not wearing the right shoes or, uh, or other equipment, and then overscheduling, that's, uh, that's a huge problem as well. You know, kids are, might, just, might just be doing too much, um, which may contribute to overuse injuries. Age is also um, a risk factor. So in general, the general rule of thumb is that you know, athletes participating, athletes should be participating in less hours per week than their age. So what does that mean? So in a 10-year-old, uh, a 10-year-old child, um, the recommendation is uh, that they should not be participating in organized sports for more than 10 hours per week. So once you start creeping over that general rule of thumb, that uh, will tend to increase your risk for overuse injuries. You know, free play versus organized sports. So free play meaning just, you know, playing in the background, back, backyard, playground versus organized sports where there's a structured, you know, practice, you know, four or five days a week. 
Uh, athletes participating in organized sports more in more than a two to one ratio compared to free play had more serious overuse injuries. <clears throat> and then finally, sports specialization. Uh, this is kind of a hot topic in the recent literature. Sports specialization meaning uh, the child is participating in one sport, you know, at the uh, to the detriment of uh, participating in other sports because they want to, you know, concentrate on that one sport. Uh, uh, sport specialization, so you know, playing baseball year round or playing one sport year round, uh, is an independent risk factor for for all injury, and this increases your risk for uh, any sort of injury by by about twenty seven percent. And it's also an independent risk factor for a serious overuse injury, uh, about a third uh, to thirty six percent increase. And a serious overuse injury just means uh, you know it, it, an injury serious enough that you require at least one month off from sports. So all these things will tend to uh, increase your risk for overuse injuries. And uh, th you know, this is becoming a little bit, this is getting more and more attention in the lay uh, media. Uh, there's a lots of um, you know, uh, pieces and, and, and uh, a lot written about you know, the kind of the youth sports machine. Uh, and these, I'm just uh, putting these, these uh, pictures up just to highlight that this, uh, this is starting to become uh, more and more prevalent and more and more uh, awareness is, is necessary uh, to address these issues. So the Washington Post um, uh, published this, uh, this, pay, uh, this piece looking at this study that was put up at the, by the NCAA. So back in 2015, the NCAA submitted a survey of all the NCAA athletes <clears throat> uh, asking them about their experiences um, with youth sports. Uh, there are some inter interesting findings here. Uh, you know, majority of the athletes that they surveyed regret specializing uh, in, in their one sport before high school. Uh, many wished that they had sampled more sports when they were younger, and many thought that they played in too many contests when they were too young. So, coming from the athletes themselves, they, you know, they these are NCAA athletes, so you know, pretty pretty high level. Uh, many of them uh, wish that they uh, did a little bit less specialization early on and were able to sample more sports. Uh, this is just a figure from uh, that study. This is looking at men and you can see um, uh, that uh, th this might not be driven primarily by them, this, this drive towards specialization. Uh, this, this question, this survey question asked, you know, since I was young, my family expected I would be, uh, uh, you know, and the, the blue is college athlete and uh, the, uh, the red is pro or Olympian. So these are the different. These are the different uh, sports on the on the bottom here. Uh, looking at um, uh, you know, at, uh, this is uh, football. This is basketball, uh, etc. So, but you can see the general uh, trend here is that a lot of you know, parents for these athletes actually expected them to be college athletes or uh, expected them to go pro or Olympian. And uh, you know, some may argue that these numbers are a little bit uh, unrealistic. So, you know, like 30 to 40 percent of parents expected their child uh, to be a pro or an Olympian. Uh, that's that, that is probably a little bit unrealistic. So uh, and the same thing with with uh, female athletes, you know, very, very high expectations for these athletes. So, you know, the point here is that, um, you know, parents are tending to put a lot of pressure on the kids, <laughs> you know, to to be, to get that college scholarship to, you know, to uh, to put in you know hours and hours of work at the driving range or the uh, or the uh, or the ice hockey rink or the batting cage with the expectation that they're going to make the pros or you know get a college scholarship um, and you know the bottom line is we sh maybe we should take a step back and really think about why why these kids why we want our kids to play sports and this kind of um, um, reiterates that. You know, this allure of college scholarships uh, kind of tends to increase the rates of uh, early sports specialization. So, you know, younger and younger kids are specializing in one sport with that goal of obtaining a college scholarship. And then uh, with that increases sports specialization, you know, there's, there's this increased tendency to have more and more elite, you know, club and travel teams uh, that uh, tend to be, uh, you know, fairly expensive. And then that, therefore, that kind of decreases the access for the non-specialized athletes. So just think your, you know, your average, you know, 10 or 12 year old uh, a kid that wants to try a new sport, you know, there's less access for them because, um, like we said before, you know, these uh, general town and rec leagues might be, uh, you know, decreasing in number. 
uh, uh, and like the elite sports club crowd, it tends to be, you know, um, nudging them out. So then there's less access for these uh, non-specialized athletes, which then in turn, you know, increases the rates of sports specialization. And it's, it's just kind of this uh, you know, positive feedback loop, which then um, uh, might be accounting for why we're seeing, you know, more and more uh, highly specialized athletes and therefore more and more of these overuse injuries. Uh, so this is just, uh, you know, something to think about. Uh, this is a study put out by, you know, TD, Ameri uh, TD Ameritrade, um, you know, essentially just uh, reiterating again that a lot of uh, uh, parents are putting pressure on, on their kids uh, to, with, with, the, with the hopes of obtaining, a, you know, athletic scholarships, uh, with the hopes of going pro, which, you know, may or may not be, uh, you know, realistic. Uh, um, why sport, you know, why sports specialization? So, you know, the, I think a lot of this can go back to this book. Um, you know, this is Malcolm Gladwell. He, uh, he's, a, he's a fairly well-known author. He wrote this book called Outliers, and it wasn't just about specialization, but one of the, one of the, uh, one of the, th one of the chapters in his book talked about this particular study. This was a study put out by uh, Anders Ericsson. Basically, what, they, what this study looked at was elite violinists, and essentially what they found was that in these elite violinists, um, essentially every single violinist that was in this, uh, I forget exactly what, um, what orchestra that they studied, but every single violinist in that orchestra, you know, had put in at least 10,000 hours of, of practice um, in order to get to where they are. So that kind of got translated in the popular media, popular press, you know, um, and, and to, to the, this 10,000 hour rule. And it kind of, kind of, kind of got translated to, oh, you know, uh, that must be true for all types of things. So, you know, you got to put in 10,000 hours of, you know, throwing a baseball in order to, you know, be elite, uh, you know, et cetera. And then they equated uh, success with uh, specialization. Uh, and um, so that's the rationale for specialization. However, you know, there is this counter argument uh, against specialization. Uh, this is another author, David Epstein, and uh, he's also another uh, you know popular author that's looked into a lot of. Uh, he writes a, a lot about you know, sports and athletes, and he he wrote this book called Range. And his argument in this book basically was that um, a broader range might be a, a better way to go about things uh, than necessarily you know concentrating on one thing. And the example that he uses is Roger Federer versus uh, Tiger Woods. You know, everybody knows Tiger Woods at a very young age, you know, uh, had uh, started uh, playing golf uh, 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 only uh, versus, and we all know that uh, Tiger Woods is ex extremely successful. And that's one way, <clears throat> you know, to go about it. But um, Roger Federer, actually, uh, we all know that he was, you know, number one tennis player in the world for a very long time. Um, uh, and he's uh, definitely at the top of his game. However, his childhood growing up was, was, was the opposite of Tiger Woods. And, you know, Roger Federer played every sport uh, growing up, and he loved playing every single sport. And he didn't really specialize into tennis until later in life. Uh, so, you know, uh, David Epstein in his book kind of goes through, you know, both approaches and why he argues that uh, perhaps uh, sampling uh, might be uh, better than specialization. And there are pitfalls of specialization, including tunnel vision, a burnout, uh, and then finally, the, the, the main you know the main thing that we're concerned about here is injury. Uh, so uh, if you're doing one thing uh, over and over and over and over again, you know the chances of injury um, will will increase. So what are the recommendations to prevent overuse injuries? Now, children should be given opportunity. This is from the AAP. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics. So children should be uh, given opportunities um, uh, for free unstructured play in order for, for them to develop their motor skills. Uh, they can self-regulate themselves to prevent injury, meaning you know, if, if, if a kid is just playing and something hurts, they're gonna stop what they're doing versus if they have a coach you know, telling them what to do, um, you know, running sprints or something, you know, they're, they're not necessarily gonna stop what they're doing even though it hurts. Uh, children should be encouraged to participate in a variety of sports and activities. Again, this promotes diverse motor skills and prevents overuse injury. You know, so you play baseball one season, but then you go, you know, uh, go swimming in the other season. That will tend to decrease the rate of, uh, for example, 
like elbow injuries uh, in, in a baseball player who's, who's throwing a baseball, you know, 12 months out of the year. You want to limit organized sports to the number of hours per week, less than a child's age. So we talked about already. So example, you know, 12 year olds should not be participating in organized sports more than 12 hours per week. And then you want to closely monitor those who are exceeding this limit for signs of injury or burnout. And then uh, all, all kids might benefit from like strengthening conditioning programs that could uh, potentially uh, uh, prevent uh, overuse injury. This also prepares them for you know, com uh, competitive sport later on in life. Uh, and then regular periods of rest should be planned during each, uh, during each year. Uh, this allows for you know physical, mental, emotional recovery. I usually recommend at least one month off of you know completely off uh, of sports built in uh, to uh, each athlete's year, and that will hopefully help prevent overuse injuries. All right, so that was kind of just a, a very broad background of why we're seeing this problem with overuse injuries in in, in our kids. Uh, now we're going to go through kind of a little bit of the the biology. So why is the developing skeleton at risk? Uh, it has increased susceptibility of, the, the immature skeleton is increased, it has increased susceptibility to repetitive injuries. Uh, this is because of the presence of the growth plate. You know, the, the, the immature skeleton is still growing, so it's, it's not as uh, robust as the adult skeleton. There are biomechanical differences in, uh, in, in the bones when they're undergoing stress. Uh, the bone quality uh, changes during rapid phases of growth. Um, uh, and then you need time to adapt to these repetitive stresses with growth. And then uh, muscular tightness and the balance can also contribute to injuries. And then finally, there are uh, hormonal changes that can contribute to injuries. Now, bone's a wonderful thing. It will react to stress. Um, so this is just an example. Like this is a kid who had a fracture. And you can see, you know, the, the, the bone will, will heal. It will respond to different uh, stresses that are applied to it. Um, so, you know, even without a fracture, if there, if there are muscle forces acting on the bone, the bone will react. So that's, uh, that's kind of the point, uh, of these overuse injuries. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this is something called glenohumeral internal rotation deficit where it, uh, pitchers tend to get this, where with these repetitive pitching over years and years and years and years, uh, people can, uh, pitchers can get kind of hyper external rotation or hyper rotation of their shoulder uh, where they're unable to actually um, uh, internally move it in a different direction in the opposite direction because they've been doing you know this motion for so long that it actually results in remodeling uh, of the bone to actually allow them to do this but then that can predispose you to uh, uh, to injuries because this is this is hyper you know this is hyper physiologic this is unnatural how much external rotation this, this pitcher can get. But this is after years and years and years of pitching where this, this uh, person's uh, bone is actually adapted uh, to that. But that's not, it might help them throw, you know, a hundred mile an hour fastball, but it might not be great for uh, overall long-term uh, shoulder and bone health. Uh, this is just a schematic uh, of uh, the growth plate. You know, many of you have heard about what, the, uh, heard about the growth plate. But what is the growth plate? The growth plate basically is this area uh, at the ends of all of our long bones that consists of cartilage. And over time, this cartilage will uh, slowly turn into bone. But while it's still cartilage, it's still relatively weak. And this is, this is how we grow. This is how uh, we get taller. This is how you know, our, uh, our bones uh, uh, grow. So and that's what the growth plate is. Uh, we talked uh, about hormonal changes. These can also play a, a role in, uh, in injury. You know, adolescents' bodies are rapidly changing uh, during the adolescent growth spurt. Uh, growth spurt again. There's this increased risk of uh, of injury. And uh, as you know, you know high, these high school athletes are starting to you know develop into adults. Um, but you know they're starting to develop adult strength, speed, and agility. However, they still have an immature skeleton, and this can translate. Uh, to, to predisposing to injury. <clears throat> so that's, that's why the developing skeleton may be at risk for injury. And now we'll just talk about uh, specific, uh, specific risk factors for injury. So epiphysiolysis, that, that basically means growth plate injury. Uh, what happens here is there's repetitive stress. There might be a decreased blood supply to the, uh, to the part of the bone that supplies the growth plate. 
And then you have a decreased calcification of the uh, a part of the growth plate called the hypertrophic zone. And this can result in um, widening of the growth plate. And this is just a sign, uh, you know, epiphyseolysis just means widening growth plate. And it's just a sign that there's some overuse injury there that can cause pain um, and rarely can, uh, could potentially affect the growth. Uh, <clears throat> uh, apophysitis, just, uh, the apophysis is like the growth plate. That just means uh, uh, an apophysis is, is a specific growth plate where there's actually a muscle attached to that growth plate, which uh, can then pull. And there's these chronic repetitive forces, and then uh, you know you can accumulate damage to the growth plate, which again results in widening of the growth plate, which then may be more susceptible to injury. This is an example of an elbow. Uh, there is the uh, there's muscles and tendons and ligaments that attach to this growth plate, uh, which can predispose this growth plate uh, to injury. What's the treatment? If it's recognized early, uh, the treatment is rest and uh, uh, plus or minus immobilization. So think a cast or a brace. If it's ignored, not treated uh, early, uh, you know, chronic damage can accumulate. Uh, you can have an increased risk for a fracture. So in the elbow, you can have something called a medial apocondyl fracture. In the knee, you can have something called a tibial tubercle fracture. And then uh, rarely, but this can happen, you can have early growth plate cl closure. So some, an example of this is called gymnast wrist. And this is an example, this picture is an example where you can see this bone, the, uh, this is the radius of the growth plate here has, is closed. You don't see it anymore because it's shut down versus you know, normally it should still be open. Uh, for example, here's the ulna growth plate, that's still open. So the, you know, the fact that this ulna growth plate is still open, that means that this radius growth plate should still be open. So this is a sign that this, uh, this growth plate has closed early and this was a gymnast who was constantly you know, uh, doing upper extremity weight bearing uh, exercises uh, on their arms, so think tumbling. Um, and uh, it probably ignored her pain and uh, eventually uh, resulted in uh, the growth plate shutting down. Uh, muscular tightness can be uh, a factor. You know, with the adolescent growth spurt, the bone growth rate tends to be a little bit more rapid than the muscle tendon uh, growth rate. So it's, it's, it's like stretching a rubber band. <clears throat> uh, the, the bone is, is growing so rapidly that it just takes time for the muscles and tendons to kind of catch up. And this means that there's increased tension on each uh, uh, on the bone uh, where the muscle inserts. Uh, the treatment here, and th that can predispose to injury. Uh, the treatment here is going to be a good regimen of stretching. Uh, strength can play a factor. Like we said before, you know, these adolescents are starting to become uh, adults, and they're starting to get adult strength. However, their uh, uh, their bones might not necessarily be ready for that yet. Um, uh, so this is this kind of um, uh, uh, increases risk for injury. Muscular imbalance, uh, the muscular strength does not, uh, may not develop evenly or uniformly. This might just result in muscular imbalance. And then muscular imbalance will result in altered movement patterns, which then can predispose to, uh, to injury. The treatment here is going to be uh, physical therapy and kind of retraining uh, to make sure that uh, their movement, uh, these adolescent athletes' movement patterns are, are normal and uh, do not predispose them to injury. Uh, joint laxity, so loose joints. So adolescents do tend to have uh, increased joint laxity compared to their adult counterparts, and joint laxity can, read, can lead to um, you know joint irritation uh, and pain. And again, the principle of, for treatment here is going to be physical therapy. <clears throat> All right, so that's kind of going through the general principles of overuse injuries. Now we're going to go uh, into the specific injuries that many of you may have heard of. So Osgood Schlatter disease. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Uh, what does this uh, uh, refer to? Basically, this is an inflammation of the growth plate of the tibial tubercle. The tibial tubercle is, is on top of the shin bone. Um, it's where the patellar tendon inserts onto the tibia. The uh, etiology or the, the reason this happens is, uh, you know, kids can have um, quadriceps or hamstring tightness, and then uh, you get the quadriceps is over pulling, um, uh, which can result in um, kind of um, uh, injury to the to the growth plate that where the uh, patella tendon uh, inserts. Uh, X-rays here, you can see a little bit of widening of this growth plate. There's, there can be fragmentation of the uh, the tibial tubercle. Uh, the treatment is going to be rest uh, or activity restriction. 
Uh, we uh, you know, typically we say no dynamic activities until pain free for at least two weeks. <clears throat> uh, stre uh, stretching regimen, stretching on the quads, hamstrings, heel cords, uh, and, and then uh, PT will specific should specifically address um, uh, specific issues that are associated with with Osher Schlatter disease. The long term problems, you know, sometimes if uh, this is a chronic thing where it wasn't treated appropriately early on. You can get some uh, ossicles in, in the tendon, even after the, the growth plate is closed, and that can be uh, painful in the future. Um, uh, rarely can you get uh, uh, an acute fracture through this growth plate. So kids who get this, this injury, uh, they usually have a, a history of uh, some sort of knee pain, maybe undiagnosed Hodger Slaughter, and then all of a sudden they're jumping for a basketball and then they sustain this uh, acute fracture. Uh, the treatment for this is going to be uh, uh, typically a uh, surgery. The treatment for uh, kind of uh, uh, bone fragments in the tendon, uh, potentially an excision of those bone, bone fragments if they're causing uh, pain or problems. This is a similar condition in the knee. This is called Sinding Larson Johansson disease. Basically, what this is, it's, uh, it's the same process as Audrey Slaughter, but on the opposite side of the knee. So, this tends to occur. In the kneecap, so the bottom part of the kneecap, you can see in the picture here. Uh, it's uh, essentially the same as Osher Schlatter disease, and the treatment is going to be the same as Osher Schlatter disease. Uh, Severs disease, uh, this is the same thing, same principle. It's a uh, inflammation of the growth plate, but this time it's the growth plate in the heel. Um, the, the etiology or the, the cause of this is kind of repetitive pounding. Also, heel cord uh, tightness can help contribute to this. Uh, this is like uh, I, I see this a lot in basketball players and soccer players, where they're uh, you know they're just kind of pounding on the heel all the time. Uh, the what happens here is that if the heel cord is tight, it can tend to pull on the uh, on the growth plate and the heel bone. Uh, the treatment is going to be rest or activity modification, uh, stretching the heel cords of the plantar fascia. Sometimes heel cups can help uh, to just offload the uh, the growth plate, and then potentially uh, shoe wear adjustments. You know, just uh, uh, proper fitting shoes. Uh, stress fractures. Uh, this is uh, this can be a problem. Uh, low, there's uh, you know low risk stress fractures and there's high risk stress fractures. The high risk stress fractures are listed here. Uh, high risk meaning that uh, these can be very um, uh, debilitating if they're not treated appropriately. Uh, low risk risk factors are just a little bit less uh, less serious. Uh, uh, this is an example of stress fracture in the femur, uh, but uh, you know do, the the reason adolescents get this get adolescents get this is because during rapid growth, bones generated at a rate that can exceed the ability of the bone to accommodate the stresses or forces applied to it. So basically, that that's the general uh, idea behind all stress fractures is you're just putting too much stress on the bone, and the bone doesn't have a chance to you know repair itself. The treatment for stress fractures. Uh, you know, we, I like to think of this as the rungs on the ladder. So if you're diagnosed with a stress fracture initially, uh, you start with, off with non-weight bearing. If that's, doing, if that's going well, you can uh, start going up to partial weight bearing. And then you can start doing a little bit more, uh, you know, walking for activities of daily living. And then uh, that's going well for a couple of weeks. Uh, you can start uh, walking for exercise and then up, up on down, up, up the ladder. And my general principles here are you can advance up the ladder, uh, you know, every two weeks. If, if you're having pain uh, after advancing a one rung up the ladder, you have to drop down another rung on the ladder uh, before you can advance again. Um, so uh, patients ask me all the time about calcium and vitamin D uh, and whether that helps prevent uh, injuries in general. Uh, uh, this is a little bit, the literature here is a little bit mixed. Um, you know, this is looking at calcium and vitamin D supplementation with stress fracture prevention specifically. <clears throat> there's a couple studies here. You know, there's a study looking at female runners and a study looking at female military recruits. Uh, the bottom line here is that, um, you know, there, what, there might be some evidence that, uh, you know, calcium uh, and vitamin D might uh, decrease the risk of uh, stress fracture. Uh, the levels of calcium and vitamin D that uh, these uh, patients were taking in these studies were definitely above the dire, uh, the, rep, the uh, recommended daily dose. Uh, so you have to take a high levels of calcium and vitamin D uh, to potentially find an effect. This is a, another study uh, uh, looking at the same sort of thing. Uh, in this study, only vitamin D was found to have uh, uh, an, an effect on helping prevent 
uh, the incidence of stress fractures. So what do I tell my patients? I, I basically tell my patients that, you know, I don't think the, the literature is mixed on whether or not calcium and vitamin D can help, you know, prevent injuries or stress fractures. However, I don't think it's harmful uh, to, you know, to supplement your daily intake with uh, uh, calcium and vitamin D supplements. Other, uh, other considerations, you know, just not just calcium and vitamin D, you have to make sure that your athletes are getting adequate calories because uh, we do know that inadequate calorie intake can predispose you to injury. Um, uh, in females, uh, irregular menses or irregular periods uh, might be a sign of a calorie deficiency. Uh, and then that in turn might uh, predispose our female athletes to, um, uh, to injury. Uh, appropriate you know, equipment, uh, running shoes uh, uh, is a, just an example of a, uh, making sure that they have appropriate equipment, appropriate equipment uh, making sure that they're, uh, you know, uh, on, a, on a, an adequate training surface. Uh, and then uh, just think about any sort of change in training intensity. So for, for example, in, uh, in our runners, you know, the, the, if you spend a summer not doing anything and then you go into the fall cross country season and all of a sudden you're running 30 miles a week, uh, versus uh, zero miles a week in the summer, that might be a problem and that might predispose you to injury uh, during that season. And then finally, uh, another point I like to make is sleep is extremely important, uh, particularly in our adolescent athletes. And this is just a study uh, that we did looking at cross country athletes. Um, uh, we surveyed uh, about 100 athletes in the NESCAC and Ivy Leagues. And uh, the bottom line here, you know, they, they, they some risk factors that we found that were significant uh, uh, for injury was that, uh, like we said before, if if there was a history of injury in the preseason, uh, that the, these athletes were two and a half times more likely to have an injury during the season. If there was a change, large uh, difference in training intensity during the season, uh, athletes were about three times more likely to increase their risk. Uh, and female athletes those with irregular menses also had an increased risk of, uh, of injury. And then finally, um, uh, those who had good sleep uh, tended to be uh, less injured. Uh, and this is just another kind of uh, a paper looking at uh, injury in adolescent athletes. This, 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 this review paper consolidated several, seven articles uh, looking at uh, sleep and its relationship to adolescent sports injury. And the bottom line, basically, chronic lack of sleep in adolescence was associated with increased risk of sports and musculoskeletal injury. So uh, athletes should be, you know, getting plenty of sleep. The AAP also endorses this. Uh, these are their sleep recommendations. Uh, you know, this, I, I just highlight this here, you know, 13 to 18 year olds, uh, you know, high school athletes, they should be, our high school athletes should be getting eight to 10 hours uh, of sleep. That's what the AAP recommends. Now, I'm not sure how many of our high school athletes are getting this, you know, think about, you know, high school students are probably going to bed between 10 and 11 uh, at night and then they're getting up to go to, to school probably between, you know, uh, around six o'clock. Uh, so they're probably not getting uh, uh, adequate sleep. Um, in order to meet this uh, AAP recommendation. Um, I just uh, point the audience to this particular segment. This was on HBO Real Sports. Uh, this is available on YouTube, uh, but it's actually a pretty good piece uh, looking at um, uh, adolescent uh, youth sports injury. It was an excellent piece, actually, um, uh, looking at this. Uh, so I, I definitely highly recommend um, uh, people to, to take a look at this. So some final thoughts. You know, overuse injuries are called overuse for a reason. <laughs> you know, uh, basically if it hurts, uh, probably should not be doing that. Um, so, and then this is just kind of a, a shirt that was, um, uh, a photo was taken here. And this, this photo is actually from one of my mentors from, from fellowship. But if you read this here, you know, uh, some are scared of pain, that's not me. And this kind of highlights uh, you know, everything that we've been talking about here. You know, keep going if it hurts. You know, this is just this is the mentality that we're that we're uh, you know grappling with in uh, in our in, in our youth athletes. So you know, keep going if it hurts. Keep going if it hurts might not be the best mantra uh, uh, going forward in order to prevent these injuries. So again. Um, I'm Dr. Uh, Aracides Cruz, work at University of Orthopedics. 
Um, you know, I thank you for allowing me to give you this uh, talk on this important topic. Uh, I'm happy to see uh, uh, folks in the community. I, can, uh, I direct you to our website to take a look uh, uh, at uh, myself as well as other providers in our in our practice. If there's any, if you need an appointment or would like to, a consultation, uh, you can look on the website. But my my phone number to my office is 401-330-1430. And again, I thank you all for uh, for the opportunity.